Commission, and we received three proposals in September, and a um, organization was selected. We have not awarded the um, funds as of yet due to um, city uh, procurement rules, but plan to do that within the next uh, couple of weeks. And you can see on there that AH was the um, organization that was selected and that who is who we plan to fund as long as there are no objections or um, issues with the, um, with the process. Um, the next item is home ownership. We wanted to give you an update on uh, where we are with home buyers. We have 16 with our North Northeast funds, eight with CET funds, three who have purchased with Prosper Portland funds and five who have purchased with no subsidy. And then we have- Excuse um, me just real quick, I hate to interrupt you. Could you uh, explain for those who may not know CET funds? CET is construction excise tax. Um, the Bureau was able to put a million dollars into uh, home ownership for down payment assistance. Those funds were able to be used citywide by families selected through the preference policy. And so we have three families um, in contract or shopping f with uh, our interstate funds and two that are shopping with uh, the remaining CET funds and then 10 families that are working towards purchasing at um, the Olin site with Habitat. So that's um, our update. And then, um, as we mentioned back, I think it was in September, we talked about budget for PHB. Uh, we are trying to be much more community focused and get uh, information and feedback from the community about what we do with our budget and priorities. We will be having a community budget meeting on December 3rd at Highland Christian Center. Um, an Eventbrite link will be coming out shortly and uh, we will be providing dinner and childcare and translation services. So um, folks that need those things will um, need to indicate that through the um, Eventbrite link. And then um, one other thing that's um, not on the agenda, but I decided to do this. Um, so uh, give me some latitude here today. Um, a few weeks ago, um, Dr. Holt was, um, <laughs> he was uh, recognized by my sorority, the Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, and uh, every year we give um, what we call our Emerald Awards to uh, African American men who are achieving great things in the community, and Dr. Holt was given one for public service, and I'll tell you the reason why. In 2014, when we started this process, he agreed to three meetings. Did y'all hear me say three meetings? That was 2014 and is 2019. Uh, he has only missed one oversight committee meeting in five years and um, we are very happy to um, support him um, in this nomination and I wanted to present your award, 2019 Emerald Award presented to Dr. Stephen Holt for dedication and commitment to public service by Zeta Sigma Omega Chapter Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. And um, this was from October 26, 2019, but they weren't ready then, so I'm giving it to you tonight. And that's my update. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, I appreciate that. I appreciate the nomination. And I especially appreciate you staying on time. <laughs> Wonderful. Any questions for Ms. Goodlow tonight? Excellent. Excellent. We're going to go then into our interstate URA development project updates. And you have a packet that is full of information. Uh, we are going to begin with Bridge. And we're going to invite Trina to come on up. And how I'm going to do it is you will have 
um, eight minutes, and then there'll be a sounding bell that will go off, and that will indicate it's time to kind of bring the thoughts to you. And this is for everyone who's doing it tonight. You'll have eight minutes to, to you know, free for all, as it were. Get as much as you can in in those eight minutes. And then once you hear the sound, you'll have, uh, it's kind of the wrap up time. And then we'll have a few minutes of interaction of Q and A. And if anything goes beyond that, we'll postpone our questioning, create a draft or a memo and get it to the presenters tonight. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, my name is Trina Whitman. I'm with Bridge Housing here to talk to you about the North Williams Project. Thank you, Leslie, for uh, leaving me with such a celebratory note. I appreciate that. I have more good news to share with you tonight, so we're just going to keep the good feelings rolling. Um, is, do I need to click this? Okay, there we go. Okay, so tonight I just want to uh, give you a quick project overview, give you an update on where we landed with our naming. Um, also a construction update and remind you where we are with our overall schedule. So um, just since it's been a few months here, I wanted to remind folks this is a 61 unit um, family size project. So we have mostly two and three bedrooms. So we have uh, 34 uh, two bedrooms, 18 three bedrooms and nine one bedrooms. And I included the AMIs there for folks that are interested in seeing that split. Um, also wanted to just remind you that this project does have 40 project-based vouchers. So that is obviously a key part of um, of our funding sourcing. And then just as a reminder, this is the building. We are about halfway done construction, constructing on North Williams. Um, folks will recall that this was the result of a number of public outreach and design meetings. Um, so um, we had already reached out to the group a couple months ago about the names that we were looking at. And one in particular had really risen to the top, which um, we ran by the group <clears throat> and we really only heard positive things, so we decided to make it official. Um, we've selected the name Songbird for the project and uh, it really was inspired by trying to connect to the vibrant jazz history in this area. We really wanted to pay homage to that um, and so that's, that's a big part of where that name came from. We also thought that, you know, uh, with the musical connotation that that just has so many positive feelings to it. You know, music brings people together across cultures and generations. So we liked kind of some of the embodiment of the feeling that came along with the name. Um, and I also really liked it because it, I thought, did a nice thing of rooting the project in the history, acknowledging the past, but there's also a real hopeful note, I think, that comes along with the name. And you know, the way that we've envisioned this project for uh, from the very beginning is that it would really be creating a new positive future for the folks that will live here. And so I really like that, <clears throat> that idea of kind of connecting the past to the future. So let's talk about construction, which is one of my favorite parts of <laughs> what I do. Uh, we, are, we completed the remediation on site. If folks remember, we had um, some environmental remediation. We were able to do that to all of our applicable standards and are actually in the process of removing um, the environmental, um, the easement of environmental servitude on the site. So that's basically taking that limitation off of the deed. Um, so we're really excited to get to that milestone. Uh, we are currently at fifth floor framing. We're on a race to get our roof on in a few weeks before hopefully weather turns into weather. <laughs> um, and then the other thing I wanted to give you an update on is we're out with DM DMWSB. You'll recall that Colas Construction is our contractor. Andrew was here with us a few minutes, a few months ago and kind of gave the group an update of where we were. Our goal um, for this project has been to hit at least 30%. You may recall that we were at 28%. Um, we have been working on improving that, um, that participation level. Um, so we were able to find a framer that was in the process of getting their certification, but they couldn't get it in time because they need it actually when the contract is awarded and not, that has already happened. Um, but with that, um, you know, if you allow that in, that would add another 11%. So we'd be at like 38%. Um, of that total, I know folks are really interested in the M portion. Um, we're at 23.5% um, M participation for this project. 
Okay, so just a reminder of schedule. We started in March. Um, we are planning on starting our lease-up process next March. Prior to that, uh, PHB will start, a, will start their preference policy project. We've heard from them that they're targeting January to do that, so that's right around the corner. Uh, we are still on track to finish construction uh, on June, so that is currently on time. And then we aim to finish up lease up and hopefully have everybody moved in around October. And that is it for my update. Happy to answer any questions. I think I did that under eight minutes. You did. <laughs> you did. You're three minutes to spare. <laughs> Very well done. Questions? Comments at all? Yeah, go ahead. In the spirit of surprising and embarrassing people, this is Trina's last oh, time with us, is, and I just wanted to say thank you so oh. much for coming and giving us updates and always being available for questions. So um, good luck and have fun. Thank and you. Thank you so much. So I just want to say thank you so much for being here all this time. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Trina. Uh, and I would add to that, we appreciate the fact that uh, the feedback we've given as an oversight committee was taken very seriously. Um, we had much to say in the early days about the design and the, the layout and even the, the responsiveness to understand the history and its importance and its impact. So I appreciate the fact that there's been great work and great responsiveness. My hope is that the next leader will be as responsive. I'm sure you'll do your best to leave some influence on that. Uh, and our, I sent you a personal email. Yes, to say, thank you very much. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, may your future be bright and your family be uh, safe as you guys do what you do. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. Thanks, Trina. Have a good night. All right. Our next is IHI Magnolia 2. Again, you will hear a bell in eight minutes. So it's on you. Thank you, committee for having us here tonight and allowing us to present. My name is Julie Garver. I'm the Housing Development Director for Innovative Housing. And I'm here to tell you a little bit, or give you an update for Magnolia 2. And uh, so the first thing is just a recap. We have 50 units of one bedroom, two bedroom, and three bedroom. Great family amenities, including an indoor play area and an outdoor play area. I have a nice little story to tell you about the indoor play area. You know how they have those rubberized flooring. We had, we had a design competition for kids at Magnolia One, and we said, we want you to design the floor. And so we got a few responses of children that drew pictures, and we're going to use one of the, their pictures as the, as the design for the playroom floor. So trying to get a little art into the building. Uh, we have resident services tailored to families, community space that is flexible and focuses on families, neighborhood goals, and units that provide good livability in compact floor plans. As you may remember, we've been working toward the maker space, which is kind of a, a new idea for us. And uh, we have a lot of participation from both the community um, constructing Hope and Brimmick Construction to bring this space together. We've already had tools donated. We have a work table donated. We have people volunteering to participate, helping to us to design the space and how the program will operate for residents and for Constructing Hope um, apprenticeship programs for youth. And, for, and that's for our residents in all of our communities and also for people in the neighborhood. So we're really looking forward to bringing that online. So the construction is, is going really well. Um, we broke ground on December 7th last year. We're currently ahead of schedule. We should be complete in mid-December. And uh, we're about 92, 93% complete. For our uh, DMWSB percentages, you might remember that we had 100% participation in our design build subcontractors, which was really exciting. And we're running about 33% participation right now. And of that, 23% is minority. And the balance is women and emerging small businesses. So we're really excited about being able to achieve that participation. 
on site. So uh, the other number that I wanted to mention to you is we're um, exceeding 50% minority numbers in our workforce training programs. And so that's a very exciting accomplishment. And we have also exceeded for a few different months during the project the number of women apprentices that uh, PHB has a goal for. And that's uh, pretty challenging in projects like ours. This is the first project that we've been able to accomplish that on. And so that's a nice number to be able to um, accomplish. We're also, we also have a program recently, we're working with artists of color to pr produce art in, in, the, uh, in the apartments. So we'll have two that are pr producing art that'll be ready for the grand opening, and then we're gonna work with one artist. After folks move in, they're gonna, he's gonna move, work with kids on site to produce more art for the apartments. So we are in our lease up period, and uh, management is uh, currently screening PHB approved press preference policy applicants. And so we are full on in the preference policy leasing process, and I'm happy to report we have 10 families that we have completed applications for already. And so that's pretty exciting. We have uh, 74 applicants that were given to us by PHB for our first round of the preference policy. And, uh, and then there's more applicants that are going to be submitting documentation here in, in the next week. And so we'll get another round of, um, of potential applicants soon. So we are optimistic that the preference policy lease up is gonna work well. We're, we're happy that the project is a little bit ahead of schedule because it gives a little bit extra cushion for a new process and that, that just provides a little bit more breathing room for everyone, which is nice with something new. And these are just some, some pictures uh, of a unit. Uh, the maker space is coming along really nicely. We, were, we did save a little bit of money, and so we were able to get solar panels back into the project, which um, they were on our add back list, so we were nice. it was nice to be able to get those back in. And uh, the exterior is looking nice. Uh, the, some folks that were involved with the Magnolia One project, we were unsure how they were gonna work together, but um, even the architect for Magnolia One said, hey, we're really pleased with how these buildings work together. And so that was uh, a, really nice, a really nice feedback. But we are pleased at how the buildings work together and some nice outdoor space and great indoor space. So be happy to take any questions if you have them. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Uh, yes, um, I was curious if you received how many applications from um, PHB for the... We received 74. 74. In this first round, and yes. that was the, the highest priority um, uh, eminent domain round. And they only the approved 10 that passed the criteria? That is so far. It takes a little while to process those applications. Now, not all of those 74 folks might want to apply. You okay. know, so after they're approved to apply, then we, you know, we contact them and we go through the income verification because that's our part of our step. And so some people decide not to apply because the units might not be right for them. Um, some maybe have already found housing. Uh, some might not income qualify, but um, we have 10 so far. We're still hoping to get some more off of the first 74 list, and then um, we'll, we'll get another list from PHB toward the end of November. And so that process will, will keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're very hopeful, in fact, to get more folks that would like to apply and that income qualify from the first 74. Thank you. Sure. Go ahead. I just was um, curious about the sonar, solar panels. What are they, what are they gonna be used or how, how is the energy from them gonna be used in the building? They're photovoltaic panels, so it's an electric system and uh, they are going to be used for all the common area electric. Thank you very much. Thank you, appreciate it. 
All right. Great timing, great pace. Proud ground. Good evening. Good evening. Great to be here. We'll cook, keep cooking through the agenda as you've well, you anticipated. Well, you know, eight and, minutes. Yeah, all right. Okay. We're good to go. Um, it's on you. And this is the clicker, right? There we go. Um, good evening. My name's Diane Lynn. I'm proud to be the executive director of Proud Ground and a wonderful team of people we're working with. And this is Gina Woolley, uh, our owner's rep uh, for the project. We feel like we're kind of joined at the hip these days and working through a lot of the issues around this uh, extraordinary project where we feel like we're really breaking new ground on a new concept of uh, this size project for home ownership. Um, the first slide, this is all gonna look fairly familiar to you. We're now just bringing you updates. And uh, we did reduce a couple parking spots. Uh, was not our choice. It was a result of the design review process and some moving around of the ground floor of the building to accommodate the 20% uh, active uh, use of the ground floor per calculations done by the design, design review process. Um, we now do have a 500 square foot community room uh, that's not designated quite yet uh, on the corner of the building. Um, I think it's uh, Interstate and what's the side street there, Mason? Um, so we'll be utilizing that. We hope maybe to invite the neighborhood in, uh, meet the residents of the building, have it be a space people could use. The street is Sumner, by the way. And um, that, that's a good outcome in the end, uh, while a bit of an extra expense and a challenge. Um, the unit count remains the same, although I'd really like to, and I know it's hard for the audience to see the uh, uh, MFI targets, uh, as you know. And again, when we talk about these ranges uh, for, with the permanent affordability model, they have to be at the lowest end of that range to begin with. So when we talk about 30%, we mean 30, 32. 60% at 60, 63% of median income, so they can migrate up the scale over time. The, uh, the prices, we wanna emphasize that those are still average prices. If a family needs more of a dis discount to make it work for them, Habitat is committed to helping uh, achieve that. If, if we can sell them at a higher level and still stay within the 30% goal for a Habitat family, it may sell at a higher price, and the same is true for the higher MFI targets, but these are average prices. There's a appraisal in the field right now through our construction loan process that'll show us the value of each of these units, and that'll help solidify what we believe to be, hope to be, pretty conservative price points for these, uh, these, these units. And again, we're looking at, of course, the market rate units uh, to, be, to sell. Um, again, hopefully affordable, affordable at maybe 100% of median income, many of them too, so. Uh, you already know the team involved here. We're just thrilled to have the Carlton Hart architectural team working very hard. LMC now out in the field with the bid process. You'll hear more about that in a minute. And of course, the wonderful folks at the Housing Development Center that have uh, just been with us every step of the way. Um, I know this is a dense um, uh, slide, but I'm gonna have Gina go through some uh, project updates. Good evening, everybody. Um, I, I, what I'm going to do is just highlight the things that have happened since the last time we were before the committee. Uh, we went through a design review process. We appealed um, several items that um, the... Okay. We, we uh, appealed several uh, design changes that the city wanted us to make. If those, every one of those would have cost the project more money. We were not successful. Um, the neighborhood appealed the 20% active use on the ground floor, and we were not successful in that, but we did reach a compromise, and we had to add um, the 500 square feet back to meet the compromise, but um, you know, I think it was a good, a, a good resolution to um, the process. Did win on all the other yes, um, and we're we're in permit. Our, we've submitted permits. We've got the first round of um, review comments on our permits, and have uh, amended um, the bids are actually on the street. We are um, everything in this project has to come together at a certain time, so we can try to keep this as close to the schedule 
that we promised and that families that are in the pipeline are working towards in terms of their eligibility. And so um, we are already out to bid, even though we don't, uh, we're, we're probably um, gonna, ha those bids are probably, we're hoping that the, the uh, subcontractors will be willing to hold those bids for uh, 45 days to, you know, 60 days. It's the, the numbers, so, but we have to go out to bid to get, to make sure that all the numbers come together and that we can get our permanent financing put in place. So it's a game of taking measured risks. Um, we are, um, we've actually fundraised. So, you know, one of the things that happened early on in this process three years ago <laughs> when we started this project was essentially, or two and a half years ago, we basically were told we don't want to put any more money in it, and this Proud Ground has done a phenomenal job of raising additional funds every time we were falling short. So we just raised another $300,000 to fill a gap, um, and we now have a balanced budget. And you know, so I just I, I think that that's worthy of mentioning, um, given the climate. Um, we Heritage Bank is just uh, submitted, I mean, just put the appraisal on the street. So that was put out, on, we'll have the appraisal back early um, December. That'll tell us the valuations. It'll allow all of our funders to underwrite their lending, uh, th their loans, PHB and um, the bank in particular. And so um, we're hoping all of that will come together. We also, uh, I will say, have made tremendous progress with the lenders, PHB and OHCS, and come to a deal structure that works for the project and that has allowed the project to move forward. So we are really grateful for all the cooperation uh, that we have received um, in trying to resolve this so this project wasn't stalled. Um, this is a, this was critical to move forward with all the documentation. This is a deal that has not been done by PHB or by OHCS. So all of the deal, all of the legal paperwork and the deal structure documents are all unique to this deal. And that means that that's six weeks to two months worth of work. And I think we've crossed the threshold last month so we can start that work. And then, um, I think that's pretty much it. Those are the main main points. Okay. okay. Over here. Um, very quickly, you've heard that PHB and Portland Housing Center are working through the list of over 640 preference policy families. Proud Ground has attended the sessions in coordination again with Habitat for Humanity and Steve Messinetti sends his regards tonight. Um, we're, we're, we've held community sessions and we're just working together with the team of, count, of, of housing counselors to again proceed ahead with the process of helping every, each and every family become mortgage ready and my goodness we're a little bit behind. We've got two more minutes. Okay, thank you and we're going to go back to Gina on NWSBA. Well, we're, um, as I mentioned, we're out to bid. Uh, the bid went out on, on November 5th, and um, Ken Bellow from LMC and I have been to, have done the rounds at all of the minority contracting um, outreach events. So we've been to P, P, um, <laughs> PMGB and um, to NAMCO, to uh, OAMI, the plans are, the full set of plans are in all of those plan centers. Uh, we're doing advertising. The other thing that's happened is that LMC is doing uh, targeted outreach. They've pulled the COVID uh, bid list and they're doing targeted outreach. They've already sent an email blast to all of the contractors on that list. And now uh, next week we will be doing call throughs to make sure that people bid on this project. The goals are 30% for MWESB participation and 20% workforce minimum. And so we'll, you know, that's what we're shooting for and we'll, we'll know in December kind of how the bids come in. As you all know, this is, it's very busy out there and thank God our minority contractors 
are, you know, are in demand right now. So we're, we're excited about that. Pro uh, the project schedule, um, we, we're, we're just uh, sharing, sorry, I keep going back and forth. <laughs> we're just, uh, we're gonna wrap up here because we, we just wanted to share that um, with about a 15 month construction uh, timeline, uh, if we can break ground in February, which we are in track to do, knock on all kinds of wood in all kinds of places. Um, so uh, it, uh, certificate of occupancy should be available by then. We expect with the families um, and the experience that Habitat for Humanity has had with the Olin and Kirkpatrick projects, we think the reservations uh, for the families that have chosen certain units um, will help us expedite the sale process. And you all know the design features, and that's the last page, and thank you very much. Well, thank you, thank you. Ladies, don't go anywhere yet. Appreciate it, thank you for being reflective and, and uh, um, putting forth that effort to stay within our time frame. A couple of comments or questions from our oversight committee members. I just wanted to congratulate you on being able to fill the shortage that you have with the 300,000 and how you did it and, and that you were prepared for it. I congratulate you. Thank you so Thank much. You. We really appreciate it. We believe in this project and look forward to a, a groundbreaking celebration in February. Ms. Julian? No. no. Well, I echo what uh, Ms. Virgie has said. And uh, just had a question just in terms of the, it looks like it's a unique approach around uh, LMC and the effort to secure and make sure that we're meeting our numbers around the um, MWESB. Um, and then the fact that we have so many that are at work. And I know that you mentioned Nate uh, and working with NAMCO and so forth. Is there something that, you, uh, that we should know about uh, as an oversight committee, because it's extremely important for us that we are very conscious of workforce opportunities, of uh, creating wealth for our minority business owners and keeping them engaged. Is there something that you would want to bring to our attention? Because if we're not up, you know, boots on the ground, there's a potential that we're not aware of how many people are, are actively working and we're concerned about what those numbers look like. So I don't know if there's something you'd like to kind of bring to our attention. Well, I think I uh, will be better able to um, answer that question at our next update because we'll we'll have the bids in. We'll have had to triage if we, if we had any um, shortage of response. We will be working. We're going to know that very shortly. And um, I think um, you know the the great thing is because I I'm out there in the environment now is that our folks are working and they've got choices. It's not like they have one job that one um, owner that's um, asking for them to work on their project. I mean, this is a unique time, I would say, in the last couple of years. I think the environment for minority contractors has changed dramatically in the region, and a lot of the contractors are have multiple choices about which projects they do when, and some of them have projects lined up into the future. And so um, I think that that's a, a huge plus. I think that we've got the, this is all moving in the right direction. It just means all of us out here who are trying to secure participation are gonna have to work harder to do that, Thank which you. is a good thing. Appreciate okay. it. Thank you, ladies. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for the work on this. Very important to us. Wanna see some families and ownership opportunities, so. Good, good, good. PCRI, King Parks. Seems like I just saw you. <laughs> good, good evening. You have to push the button on this one. Thank yep. you. Um, good evening, my name is Kimberly Horner and I am the newly hired executive director for PCRI, which is the Portland Community Reinvestment Initiative. 
So I want to thank you for allowing us to present this information this evening. Um, to my right is Andrea Debman, and she is my um, housing... <laughs> She's whatever I need her to be. <laughs> she, uh, Andrea oversees um, um, our resident services program, and in back of us is the rest of her team, and they can wave their hands so that you can see them. So, um, and to my right is also Rachel Lopton, who is my senior project manager for the King and Parts project, and she's also my uh, senior housing developer. Obviously, I'm new to my position. I've been here in Portland for approximately 138 days. Um, what I'd like to do is just start off with a little bit of an overview of the project, and then I'll turn it over to the ladies that have been working very diligently on this project, and they will be able to field questions that you might have for them. So the King and Parks project um, was originally, conceptually came about about two or three years ago. Um, we level, lovingly refer to it as King and Parks because of its orientation. It is on Martin Luther King Boulevard and the other corner is the Rosa Parks. So that's what we currently refer to it as, but it is not its official name. Um, part of the development team includes myself, Rachel Lofton, um, we also have Charles Funches, who is also in my housing development um, department. And again, as I mentioned, Andrea is here with me as well, um, and the rest of our resident services team. We also used um, our legal team to help us move through the legal aspects of this project, and I, I think it's important to call them out. That's um, Miller Nash, and we also use Warren and Sugarman on this project. The architects are Merriman Barnes, and we also, um, similar to some of the other projects, are using Colas as the construction company. And naturally, and of course, we are using a development consultant to help us um, through this process, and that's the Housing Development Center, HDC. The financing for this project is uh, pretty extensive. We used, um, it's, a, it's a tax credit project, and we have approximately 11 million in LIHTC for, for this particular project. We also have about um, 400,000 from OHCS. We have additional monies for, from OHCS from their weatherization program. Um, the land came from the Portland um, Housing Bureau. Um, we use City of Portland SDC waivers, um, the City of Portland ex, um, excise tax waivers, and we also received tax increment financing from the Portland Housing Bureau, and of course a permanent loan um, in the tune of about five million on this project. We received Metro grants and we have some deferred developer fees. Uh, the timeline on this project, the financing began um, closed in December of uh, 2018 last year. Um, we received a notice to proceed from PHB um, in January of 2019. Um, the groundbreaking occurred February 15th um, of 2019, and it's a 16-month construction period. We anticipate the construction completion being June of 2019. And I'm going to turn um, the next set of this presentation over to Rachel so that she can take you through the construction phases. All right, just to give you a quick update, uh, the amenities for this project, we have a, it oriented with the central courtyard so that way we can encourage residents to get to know each other. There's front stoops that are gonna be looking from the townhomes out over the courtyard. 
really giving people an opportunity to sit on their porch and get to know their neighbors. Uh, we're gonna be having a play area in that central courtyard. We have a large ground floor community room that's very spacious, many windows, right overlooking MLK and Rosa Parks. We're also going to be having uh, laundry rooms on every floor of the building. The construction site, uh, wonderful for me, is located about a half a block from our office, so I can walk over for all of my construction meetings. Uh, but great for our residents, it means that they can pop into our office whenever they need us. Uh, also, a wonderful thing about the location is that we are very close to the freeway. We're about a 10 minute bus ride from the MAX line and very easy access to anywhere you need to be. So the unit mix, so this is a 70 unit uh, development, of one, two, and three bedrooms. Uh, we have one bedrooms that total about 20 units and broken down by project-based section eight units, 30% units, and 60%. Um, and two bedroom units will total about 38 in the project, again, broken down by those same uh, median incomes and including a unit designated for an on-site manager. Uh, and then 12 three bedroom units Again, broken down by project based section eight and those at or below 60% of the area median income. At this point, um, I'd also like for Andrea to talk a little bit about when we anticipate leasing up and what that process looks like for PCRI. I, the goal would be, um, well, one, of course, to have it leased up by the time it's completed. <laughs> so that is ideal. Um, but I think considering the conversations and the work that's taking place with property management as well as the Bureau and working out the particulars for marketing of the development, uh, the goal is that that would happen towards the latter part of the year, early in the year, uh, giving the applicants an opportunity to go through that process uh, so that uh, maybe late February, ideally, uh, folks will begin that lease up process. So that gives us that 120 day window. Is that right? 120 day window that's needed in order for us to fulfill our obligations. And that concludes our presentation, and we're happy to answer any questions that you may have. Seven minutes and 35 seconds. We'll look at you. Um, questions, a couple questions. Uh, first, well, any of the committee? Comments, questions? Jillian? Okay. Um, I would, I, what I think is a quick question, why was there the delay between the financing close and the notice to proceed from PHB? Um, during that time, PCRI was going through significant staff transitions, and there was conversations between PHB um, and PCRI as far as continuing with the project, is my understanding. That was prior to me stepping into this role. Okay. Uh, I don't see it, and I don't remember, and I don't know if you guys have it off hand um, or on hand. Bedroom si the unit sizes, like square footages, do we know what they're going to be? It is a pretty wide range. The one bedrooms, I believe, are around 750 square feet, going up to, I believe, 1,400 square feet for the three bedrooms, but I would need to double check that. Next question, the three bedrooms, are those gonna be townhomes? Are those the townhomes all of them will be? A mixture of townhomes and garden flats. Okay. Are there gonna be two bedroom townhomes? Or the townhomes are only gonna be three? The townhomes are only three bedrooms. Okay, all right. And I was trying to get a, a, a view of what that mixture would look like the uh, and maybe you, you have an idea of what that layout would be. And if not, that's okay. We'll get it at some point. But I'm, I'm just trying to get a view of what it, what it mm -hmm. kind of how it plays out. I like where are mm -hmm. they going to be located uh, within, the, mm -hmm. within the facility, et cetera. So if you look at the aerial view there, 
that front section is already up to the fourth floor now along MLK and Rosa Parks. The back section is where the townhomes are. There are uh, two, two story townhomes on the bottom two floors and then there are a single level of apartments above that sloped roof and then parking on the back. Excellent. Any other? Yeah. Um, just one correction that we'll want to make for the website. You have that construction is going to be complete in June of 19. That already 20, passed. 20, <laughs> so yes, 2020. We want to make sure we get that corrected before and just for that's folks' an easy, information. That's an easy fix. Yes. <laughs> it's praying. We'll, we'll reverse time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thank you. Great presentation. Good work. Thank you. Reach, come and join us. Believe it or not, we're out of time. Let me just say, make a statement to all of those who have presented up to this point. Thank you so much for being timely and uh, uh, consistent within our constraints. Part of the the proposed or anticipated dynamic about a tight schedule was that we'd have more of our committee members and if you have been at any of our committee meetings you know that our committee members oftentimes have questions and engage and so we've been those five minute uh, anticipated intervals of questions and uh, interaction have been uh, kind of alleviated which therefore has moved us forward but in the sake for the sake of equity for the sake of being equitable we're going to keep us all on schedule. So, eight minutes, announce yourselves, and you can go. We should introduce ourselves. I'm Dan Valier, the CEO at Reach. I'm Pamela Benoit, the Chief Operating Officer at Reach. Erica Tucker, Equity and Inclusion Manager at Reach. And uh, I think we'll start. Pamela, do you want to begin with uh, a little picture? Sure. So let's see, I'll, I'll do the slide. Uh, so first of all, I want to thank uh, PHB and this committee for entrusting us with the resources of the city to allow us to create this wonderful home for 189 families. I envision uh, in July of 2020 when we open this building, uh, families thriving in this community, you know, engaging in the, the community around them, bringing the community into the building to program our community space with services for healthy living and uh, education, the arts, and um, enjoying the outdoor space, the courtyards, um, you know, playing games, uh, watching the children, walking over to the park. So uh, thank you so much for uh, entrusting us. And we look so forward to engaging with PHB and um, qualifying the homeowner, the residents and uh, getting them moved in and settled into their new homes. So rather than go through all the data on the slides, I think Pamela just captured a lot of it, but I'll, I'll slide through them. I won't go through all the details. 189 homes, you heard it. And you, can, you heard of some of the community spaces. Oh, I missed the slide. Thank you. The building name. So this is the first meeting where we have had an official building name. It had been referred to as the Argyle for some time. The name is the Renaissance, is Renaissance Commons. And uh, the name emerged from a number of discussions we've had around the community, but um, probably the most impactful one was uh, input that was gathered and convened by Vanport Mosaic. Um, Vanport Mosaic, of course, has convened a community of elders that uh, lived in Vanport and survived the 1948 flood. So uh, we had a meeting to discuss our project and get their feedback on 
not just the name, but the project itself, uh, the north, uh, the north side of of the of the property. When you look out, you're looking over, you know, the historic site of Vanport. It's about, you know, a little mile, mile away, but it's you know a sight line. So um, they felt that was um, significant. We asked what they thought about incorporating the legacy of Vanport in some way. Um, and so we had a long dialogue about that. The name emerged from that discussion. Um, several people in the meeting suggested that while Vanport as a community is no longer there, um, that there is an idea of a renaissance of the spirit of what Vanport was about. So we, we took that to heart and thought about how we would do that. And I think Pamela said that best, You know it, what that vision might look like. So that's a little bit on the name. Erica, do you want to add anything? You were there too, to that at that meeting. Did I miss anything? So you might talk about um, how we're going to use our equity in some playground in the building. <laughs> okay, thanks. We one one thing that came up in the uh, input was the community space that you heard Pamela mention, and we are going to strive to have partnerships and have other organizations, and we've had some early conversations, but I say that today, anyone who's watching, who's interested in that, it would be a free space that could be used for programs for the residents of the building, but also for the community. So if anyone's hearing this and is interested in that, we are uh, really ex open to talking to anyone who wants to operate program there, it'd be open. Um, I think the other thing I would highlight from the slides, and you can come back through your questions, is um, leasing, which we are, like everyone, working toward. Um, we are searching for lease-up space in the community also, since the building won't be done when we're starting lease-up. So we'll be looking to rent some space temporarily in the community. So again, anyone's listening and uh, has an idea on that, we would be you know, renting some space. Um, equity in construction. I think, again, just following up on some of the progress uh, points, we're currently tracking between 31 and 33% of participation, um, MW, DMWESB. Uh, just looking at M minority businesses, it's 26%. Uh, and um, uh, and that includes 11 minority-owned businesses, seven women-owned businesses. Um, apprenticeship numbers are up there as well. 53% uh, of journeymen, minority germ or minority journeymen, 40% um, of apprenticeship hours, minority apprentices. So that's our current tracking data. We'll come back at the end. And that is the schedule. How are we doing on time? We can move to questions. You're great. Yeah? Yeah. yeah great. Well, again, I'll just end by saying thank you and echoing Pamela. This is um, stretching reach. I think Erica would uh, attest to that too. There's a lot of new questions and challenges for us here, but it's exciting because it's about building community in a different way for us. So thanks for giving us this chance to stretch reach. You excellent comments or questions from oversight committee tonight. Um, I I know I'm not on the committee, but um, I <laughs> it's great that you're including a fitness room. I I just think that that's uh, you know goes a long way towards um, creating community and for folks to be healthy and have opportunity to work out and um, be active. So I think that's a great amenity. So a couple of comments. Um, we've met periodically throughout the process and uh, I think this fits into one of those program, uh, one of those processes that started a little rocky and we had to revamp, reevaluate, reconsider and I appreciate the responsiveness, the effort, and the energy to reflect the input from the committee, the concerns of the committee, and most of all, to be thoughtful about 
what we're building. Because this isn't just throwing up uh, sticks and bricks. Not for us. Our concern isn't merely just um, kind of uh, herding people into spaces. It's also about creating dignity, worth, value, esteem, care, community. It's about understanding of people who've been traumatized, impacted, marginalized, displaced, and I could go on and on and on. You've heard me, you know that this is a passion of mine. I appreciate also the idea around Renaissance co Commons for those of you who don't know. Uh, my parents lived in Vanport. My mother was in third grade when the flood hit. And so for me, um, I've said it before, but I'll say it again. I'm not sitting here just to occupy a seat. I have vested interest in what happens in North and Northeast Portland, and specifically what happens around black people in North and Northeast Portland who've been the most impacted people in Portland. And so um, I appreciate the effort and the energy that you put forth to be reflective and thoughtful, and I look forward to uh, continuing our engagement as we go forward. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right, before we move forward, uh, amazing. We're actually ahead of schedule, but we're gonna keep doing what we've been doing in terms of our timing. Uh, I think we're going, that the meeting is going very well. Anybody else feel the same way? We're liking it? Excellent, excellent. Was there anybody who wanted to stay to 9.30 still? No. Okay. okay, we're gonna let you guys hang out. It'll get dark because the lights will go off on their own. And uh, all right, next we have the Hill Block update from our own uh, Oversight Committee member, Jillian Siraj. Hello. Do I, oh, do I need the, should I sit up there? I don't wanna sit up there. <laughs> Just click, yeah, that's good. Um, so we are now the Williams Russell Project Working Group instead of the Hill Block Working Group so that everybody knows where it's located, which is on the corner of Wilson and, or Williams and Russell. See, I still do it. Russell Williams, okay. Um, anyway, so we voted in our last meeting to request to be added into the URA. Um, so I'm bringing that request forward to the committee to for the committee's support. We have not decided whether or not URA funds are appropriate for the site, but um, recognize that the more funds that are available, the more options that there are for a developer to present a, an acceptable project. Um, for those who don't know, this is about one 1.7 acres of land that was taken through um, eminent domain by what was then Emanuel Hospital, which is now Legacy, and due to the timing, hmm? and P yeah, PDC, and due to the length of time that it has taken um, Legacy slash Emanuel to develop the site, they have gone past the, long past the amount of time that they were supposed to. So it is coming back to, uh, for public use. And the Russell Williams, uh, Williams Russell um, project group, are ta we are tasked with selecting a developer for the site and programming at the site. So that's just, I probably should have started there. My apologies. Um, and I think, oh, we have a community survey that uh, we spent some time doing some visioning and figuring out what, as a working group, were our priorities for the site. And they range from housing to home ownership to support from entrepreneurs to um, uh, support for the arts. So when you have a chance, I, I would really appreciate if you would go on to the Hillblock uh, website and fill out the community survey and the more data that we have to support our decisions, the better decisions that we can make. Um, let's see, survey. <laughs> a lot of pages there. And that is really all of the update that I have for the moment. Um, we, it, the website is prosperportland.us 
backslash Williams Russell, not William Russell, but Williams Russell. So that S is important or you won't get there. And the survey is on the website. And I look forward to keeping everybody updated as we move forward and uh, decide what the programming of the site is gonna be and how we are gonna best next move forward. And I'm happy to answer any questions from the committee or anybody else really. Can you, uh, Jillian, can you give us a, uh, an idea of kind of the makeup of the project working group? If you kind of talk a little bit about the various, how many people and, and where they're from. And so kind of we thing. started with, I think, 26 members and we've had some people cycle off of the group. So I think we're at about 19 or 20, if memory serves. Um, we have voting members and non-voting members. So the non-voting members are the representatives from Prosper, the city, the Portland Housing Bureau, and Legacy. Um, they are not, we felt as a group that that was, well with their participation and input and um, expertise was very valuable that the decision should lie with the community and not with those who had taken the, or been part of taking the property away. Um, so there, the Urban League is represented, this group is represented, the North Northeast CDFI is represented, um, and then we have various community members from Self Enhancement Inc. Um, I, let me see. Uh, the Black Investment Consortium, um, and several community members from the community at large. So we have a quite a diverse group uh, based on experience. And, um, and yeah, that's, I think that's. And how often does the group meet? We meet where? once a month. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so helpful. It's like we rehearsed. Uh, once a month on the first Wednesday at uh, from 5.30 to 8.30 here. Except next month when we are meeting at the um, Asian Health Center. No? That was, that was last month. month. Oh, I missed that one. Yeah, okay. you wrote a show recital. <laughs> I'm terrible, I'm an I'm a, I'm a unreliable narrator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So December 4th, here, um, and everyone is welcome. Wow. And you'll see and at couple. least the three of us again. That is no. true. And we're a good time, so. We are a good time. <laughs> Go ahead, you're coming. Um, so uh, I'm the PHB representative, a non-voting member, but um, the survey is really important. And um, the information that folks have um, has the, the survey monkey link. Um, we did, were presented with the initial um, uh, information from folks that had taken the survey, about 350 people had taken it um, as of our meeting this month, and 88% uh, of them had selected housing as their first priority. 83% um, had selected um, workforce training and education for adults, and then uh, like 78% wanted uh, a community space for the building, so it is really, really important for folks to um, to take the survey and um, make your voice heard and get that out to other people for them to be able to participate um, as we go forward and make a decision about what to put on that property. Absolutely. Uh, Ms. Virgie, was there anything you wanted to, any comment? Uh, I happen to be the facilitator, coach, coordinator, support of the <laughs> Williams Russell project. So yes, I'm very engaged and we'll be there together. I think it's important for everyone to be aware that this is also one of the historic places uh, for the North Northeast community and specifically the African American community and the history for what has happened again around displacement and uh, kind of a trauma impact. And the goal is to do something very thoughtful, very intentional, very purposeful. Um, it's not restorative justice, it isn't that by any means, and it's not reparations, but it is some, the uh, step in, in the right direction and being aware of the impact of what's happened in our city. So your voices matter, we'd love to hear from you, love you to get involved and uh, be present. I think that's 
all I've got to add. Anything else before we move on? Awesome. Matt, come and be with us, please, sir. And in the spirit of equity, we're going to continue with our same timing approach, sir. You will hear a buzz in eight minutes if you go that long. Introduce yourself and let us have it. Um, Matthew Schaubold with the Housing Bureau. Yeah, I have two slides. So um, there are some slides up here, but I, I, would, I think I'd also encourage uh, folks to use the handout because they have it in their packets and it is uh, in printed in color, which will make it easier to read. So um, before I talk about some of the numbers, uh, I think to take a step back. So uh, one, I want to acknowledge the, the our partner organizations and the staff at the Housing Bureau. Uh, we are in the process of the largest preference policy lease up that we've done over about a 12 to 18 month period of time. So from about, I would say, maybe March to April of this year through June, July of next year, we'll be leasing up a total of five buildings, four rental buildings and one home ownership buildings, one, one home ownership building. And so it is a pretty heavy lift. And so I just want to acknowledge that everyone's working very hard and I know I appreciate it and the Bureau appreciates it. So just want to recognize everybody who's not sitting at the table. Um, so the two buildings I want to talk about tonight are the, I'll start with the 5020. Uh, North Interstate Building, and so you heard an update from Proud Ground this evening. Uh, we started, we ran the application process from April 22nd to May 3rd of this year. It was a two-week application window, and in total we got around 650 applicants. Uh, we're seeing a you know, fairly consistent uh, spread in terms of the number of applicants by point cohort and uh, race ethnicity by point cohort and across the entire application pool that we've seen uh, through our, our previous rounds. Uh, at this point, I believe all of the applicants through the four and maybe three point cohorts have been passed to the Portland Housing Center and are working on becoming mortgage ready. And as the Housing Center can take on more applicants, we will, we will transfer those. Um, so, so far the process is going well. Uh, again, we closed that application window in May. We processed over the summer. Um, and kind of you see the results up here. I don't want to read off numbers, but I mean, what I will say is again, as a reminder, it was for 40 affordable units, about 40 affordable units. And so we got about 16 times the number of applications as we had homeownership units on 5020. And I, I'm happy to answer any questions on this one before I move on to Magnolia 2. Committee, any questions? All right. So shortly after the 5020, if you turn the page, we pivoted right to uh, the Magnolia 2 round. And the application window for the Magnolia 2 was September 3rd uh, to September 16th. And um, again, we saw a similar number of applicants. It was a two-week application window just after the Labor Day weekend. There was around 700 total applicants. Again, we're seeing a fairly similar spread in terms of the by point cohort, as well as race ethnicity overall and race ethnicity by point cohort. Um, we did something new in this round. Uh, so traditionally what we've done is we verify the, the preference of applicants at the Housing Bureau. Uh, we accept documents, people mail them in, people come in, and then we transfer the list to the partner and uh, our partners in Magnolia 2 wanted to try something different and so we did we're, we're working through a co uh, kind of a co located verification pre application process and so we are actually physically at the Magnolia 1 uh, and we we are verifying applicants at that location and while they're there they can actually fill out a kind of pre-application form for the units themselves and they can get some questions answered. I think it's been somewhat successful. We are seeing that more and more applicants and perhaps because they're also getting more familiar with the process are choosing to uh, use email and fax uh, to send in their preference documents rather than in person but we're there if folks want to. In fact we have staff there right now or until 8 p.m., I don't know what time it is. 
Um, and so we're in the middle of a second round of this kind of co-located verification pre-application process. So as our partners uh, mentioned earlier, we sent over around 70 applicants and those were the eminent do verified eminent domain and uh, six point applicants. And by the end of November, they will get another slightly over 600 applications. And so we will be closing out the verification round for Magnolia 2. Um, our target date is November 27th. We'll pass the 600 something applications over and then we will be pivoting right to our next round, which will be the um, Songbird, Renaissance Commons and King and Parks. So um, we're prepping for that round. I don't have a, a slide for that, but uh, again, we'll be doing something different because we'll be leasing around 250 units, which is more units than we've ever leased. Um, and it's significantly uh, in uh, Renaissance Commons. Um, so, you know, we have historically had either one week or two week application windows. And depending on the time of year, depending on the round, we get somewhere between 700, 600 and 1,000 applicants. So for this upcoming round, given that it's three buildings and we're coordinating with three partner organizations, we will be doing two months. We'll have a two month application window. Uh, and so we're looking to, we're finalizing the date, but it'll likely be January 6th, the Monday after the week that has the New Year's holiday. Uh, and that round will close out toward the end of February. Uh, and then we will begin the verification process so that we can then pass the verified applicants to the three partner organizations. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Matt. Questions, committee? So when you are op when you are opening up the wait list for folks um, at PHB, you are opening up for a group of buildings or for a single building? How does that, how it, sure. it did, walk me through that a little bit? Yeah, so it depends on the round. Um, we, you know, we did the Garlington by itself. We did the uh, Charlotte Rutherford and the Beatrice Morrow together. We did 5020 by itself. We did Magnolia 2 by itself, and we will do the three buildings all at once. So it's just a matter of timing for when, we, when we'll need them, and uh, these three buildings just happen to all line up for uh, next June. So if someone had applied for the Beatrice Morrow and Charlotte Rutherford and the, those two buildings didn't get that far down on the list, do they then have to reapply to be in another building? Yeah, we, we don't roll the applications over, but we do directly contact them because we have their contact information and encourage them to resubmit. And, they, and they, if they do, they don't have to go through the preference verification again. They just have to come in and verify their identity. And we already have all of their preference verification on file. Well, that kind of addresses my, one of my questions. So among those, uh, Matt, are we seeing a lot of repeats? Um, do you have any idea? And I obviously, I don't expect you to have numbers in your head, but yeah. yeah. I, you um, I, don't. I, I don't have the numbers in my head. I think, we're, I think we are seeing repeats, um, and I can look into that and follow up with a better sense of the percentage in each round. Um, but I do, we, are, we are getting repeats, we are getting folks that are familiar with the process, and we also get a, a kind of a different, um, uh, you know, a different set of the community depending on if it's home ownership or if it's rental, and then also the, pro, the, the units in the, in the rental buildings, whether they're mostly studios or mostly two and three bedrooms, but we definitely are seeing folks come in that have been through before. Um, but I can look into that and follow up with specifics. So, um, and I appreciate it. I know that, um, and because I'm so engaged and involved with what's going on with PHB and, and hear a lot of the conversations and have a chance to engage around some of the conversations. I know it wasn't thought about or planned or prepared to uh, kind of staff this as an ongoing work. Um, so can you speak to a little bit of the challenges or things that we should know about as an oversight committee related to the preference policy, since it is something we highly value mm -hmm. and, and support 100%. And I know we've got a, at least one commissioner that's not so much in favor of the preference policy. Uh, and I'd like to see it continue. So uh, tell us a little bit about what the challenges are, how we can support. 
Sure. Um, so I think I'd first specifically like to recognize Divisha Gordon, who's in the room, or at least was when I walked up here. Um, she has been uh, a core part of getting the program running through all of the application processes, and we really couldn't have done it without her. Um, there, there has been a challenge. You know, we um, historically, the Bureau historically has not administered application processes for this kind of program. And so when we first, when we developed the preference policy with the community task force and we started the implementation, we kind of had to pull together some resources internally. And so we've over, you know, in the first few rounds, we, I think, had maybe one, one and a half full-time staff dedicated to it. And then every time we did a round, we'd have to kind of reassign people internally or you know, try and find some temporary support to um, do the, the work of the advertising and the community work and then assisting applicants and processing the applicants. Um, we, through the, these rounds, through the 50-20 round and the uh, Magnolia 2, uh, we we have brought on one additional temporary staff, so there's about th three to four core staff where a big part of their job or all of their job is, has been administering the um, uh, 50 20 in the Magnolia 2 round. We are going to be hiring another temp. The, I don't know if I'm supposed to say this, the posting should go out on Monday. We're hoping it goes out on Monday. A very quick turnaround, so if people are interested, it will be a six month temporary position. Um, to help us with the three building rounds. So we'll have, with some, our current staff and some staff reassignments, you know, four to six FTE. Um, but I think in terms of, you know, where the oversight committee can help in the long term, you know, we are doing what I would consider temporary measures, both in terms of staffing and, you know, the financial resources to support the advertising and the marketing and the community work. Um, but even once all of these buildings are, are moved through their initial lease up, we will have to maintain an ongoing annual process to keep a fresh list of interested applicants for ongoing vacancies. And that does, re that does require ongoing staff. It does require resources. Um, we need a, a better uh, data system to manage the application process. It's um, pretty labor intensive right now. And so I think just, where the, over, where, where the oversight committee could be helpful from my perspective is, you know, as we move through these buildings, I mean, one, you've always been strong supporters of the preference policy, and so I don't need to ask you to continue that, but don't lose sight of to maintain this in, in the future when we don't have new buildings coming online is just as important so that as units become vacant, we can release them. So just the, the um, support for ongoing resources to maintain this uh, in the future um, when maybe there's less attention on it because we don't have a new building opening or three new buildings opening in a particular year, fiscal year. Um, could you talk a little bit about the, either the success that you've had with the co-locating staff um, for lease up and how has that been more or less or the same amount of successful as prior buildings? I know that we've had some, I and mean, we've heard from our partners that there have been some challenges with the communication, and I assume, I'm assuming that when you're sitting right there with somebody, those um, challenges are less, but I just wanted to ask how it's going and what are the lessons learned, and um, is it better or worse or the same? I don't know if it's better, or I don't know if I could say better or worse or the same, but um, you know, uh, from my perspective, it has definitely sped up the process. So part of the reason we were, were doing the co-located was because we were under such tight timelines over this 18-month window, and we wanted to make sure to get applicants to the Magnolia 2 staff uh, in time for them to you know, move through all the applicants. And so I think that has been successful um, in cutting and shaving off a, a few weeks in the process. Um, and I think that there's, it's forced a lot more coordination leading up to the application round than we've had to have before, um, just because we're coordinating space and coordinating when we're gonna be at the Magnolia One. And so I think a natural 
you know, derivative of that is that we're better coordinated overall, not just with the co-location. So I think it's definitely uh, going well. I think the challenge is just from the Bureau side is resource. Uh, we still have people coming into the Bureau and all of our folks are in the field or most of them are in the field. And so we've had to split staffing a bit. Um, and, you know, it has proved, I think, at least from my personal perspective, less um, popular than we thought it would be. I think, as I mentioned before, more and more people are just emailing them in or mailing them in or faxing them in. But I think that it's good that we're on site outside of downtown, um, particularly for applicants that may be going through the process for the first time. So I think it, it's, it's good. It's definitely, it's been positive. So, yeah. We'll be pursuing what options do exist in the next round. It won't be able to be the same thing because it's a three building round and we can't be in three buildings at once all the time, you know, depending on our staff capacity, but we're interested in what our options are and we're gonna be trying to figure that out in the next few weeks. Yeah. Thanks, Matthew, appreciate it. Thank you all. Thanks for the work. Appreciate the importance in staying on top of the preference policy. Um, I am an avid supporter of what it is accomplishing and what it is meant to do. So thanks for the work and the energy. I know it's not been easy. <laughs> it's been a great learning curve. I yeah, appreciate your time. Thanks. Bond, Metro Bond update. We invite you to the table. Hi, Molly. Hi, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Just in the spirit of time, I'm going to, I think, just um, cover the first few slides in a more expedited way and, and then get into what I call more the, the strategy elements of the Metro local implementation strategy. So what I'm presenting here tonight is the culmination of uh, nine months of community engagement and feedback, uh, as well as uh, strategy uh, and writing of an actual 38-page plan of what we call our draft implementation strategy to implement the Metro Housing Bond, which was passed in November 2018, so about one year ago. Uh, just very quickly, um, $652 million was passed in a regional general obligation bond uh, with the goal of housing 12,000 people. And the hope is to create new homes all over the region, including Washington County, uh, Multnomah, and Clackamas counties. The production goals region-wide is 3,900 homes, of which 1,600 are meant to be affordable at households earning 30% of area median income. Metro also set a goal of half of those units would be family-sized, which they've defined as two bedrooms or larger. And they also uh, created an additional provision to allow 10% of the units to be affordable to households between 61 and 80% of area median income. As I mentioned, it's a region-wide region uh, bond, which is exciting because we live in a region housing market. These are uh, a few slides around our housing need in Portland, but you guys are very well aware of the housing crisis and how uh, disproportionately it has affected communities of color, particularly in neighborhoods like North and Northeast. Uh, and, uh, additionally, uh, uh, we supported uh, and uh, are completely aligned with Metro's uh, po priority populations for those uh, communities of color, families with children, people living with disabilities, seniors and veterans, and those experiencing homelessness aligns very well with Portland's values and goals for particularly for our Portland Metro Bond as well, Portland Bound. Uh, and leading with racial equity, we think of this as a comprehensive set of strategies starting from a, a beginning of a project concept and doing outreach and engagement similar to the work that you guys have modeled here in this committee uh, we're looking at things, everything from project selection and the process by which uh, peop, uh, our developers are engaging with uh, MWSB contractors, and also looking at marketing and lease-up strategies to ensure they are get, gaining access 
uh, and providing better access for communities that have been underserved in our housing market. And we are following up with additional metrics and reporting to look uh, and ensure that we're tracking on our racial equity goals. Our in community engagement strategy is we, we went through a nine month process when we first rolled out the Portland housing bond. And those uh, values were very much still uh, valid and needed to be expanded upon because we recognize that we weren't meeting all the various needs already with the Portland housing bond and we wanted to continue um, expanding housing opportunities for with those um, areas that may not have uh, as much accessibility to affordable housing. But we also took the opportunity to dive deeper in areas that we just didn't feel like we did uh, were able to do as much engagement on you know, two years ago. So we uh, expanded some additional feedback sessions uh, and focused in areas that we had identified through the Portland bond, such as Southwest, North and Northeast, and East Portland. And these themes have informed our local implementation strategy. We did all various different types of engagement from surveys, focus groups, email notices, and various feedback sessions, which then culminated in our, uh, our draft plan. And the themes from that work was, yes, we should continue those effective strategies from the housing bond. Don't just throw everything away, build upon those things that have been successful, but do some better and focused efforts to reach communities that haven't been as fully um, uh, were able to be as targeted, and that was really specific to immigrant and refugee communities. We wanted to do additional outreach with, with, those, um, with partners and also with people who are actually, we uh, spent some time with a committee of new, new Portlanders and had some focused sessions with them. And we uh, continued to looking at better and clear measurable goals for, goals for equity, and then how do we best align and, and leverage those metro resources with our existing strategies and resources to make our best, best uh, bang for our buck. We were told over and over again we needed to continue to secure, we needed to secure services and rent support uh, for the 30% for the area median income goal target that Metro set for us. So if you, um, if you look at how are we gonna meet all the various sub goals uh, within uh, a whole project. Uh, what we know is that you do tend to need some level of subsidies for a portion of our 30% units or else the project is not financially viable. But Metro's bond work didn't um, come with vouchers attached as part of the um, bond work. Um, the Portland bond, uh, at the, before that passed, um, the city of Portland was able to secure a commitment from Home Forward for um, project-based vouchers to help achieve the 30% goals that we had set out for Portland. So the, the big um, challenge really for us in grappling with the implementation of the Metro Bond has really been around how we're gonna achieve the 30% goals without that additional support. So we've been um, having various conversations and with our partners try to look at new ways of doing housing development, um, but this will continue to be a challenge because as of today, um, there is not a dedicated uh, stream of operating support yet, but partners are working on it. We want to continue to use low barrier screening. This is really important to the stakeholders we talk to. We also are setting goals for supportive housing. Um, in a, in a, we, the city of Portland, in, 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 as well as Multnomah County and Home Forward has a regional, uh, a, a county-wide goal of creating 2,000 permanent supportive housing units. As of today, after the Portland housing bond announcements, we are close to 800 on that 2,000. We want to continue advancing that goal with the Metro bond as well. Uh, we also are, uh, are allowing home ownership as a use of funds. And we also were um, wanted a, uh, we are looking at how do we make sure that our development partners are doing targeted outreach to different cultural communities. So our strategy is um, our over our overall production goals is to create 1,475 for Portland. 
of which 605 would be affordable to households at 30% area median income, and 737 would be two bedrooms or larger units. Metro had identified prior to the passage of the bond uh, some early win projects, what they called phase ones, that uh, were working in partnership with the housing authority because at that time we did not we didn't know um, the ownership structure by which we could deploy the resources, um, and so that um, a twenty three million dollar de um, deployment commitment to Home Forward is in support of our Decom Court project, or I should say their Decom Court project, which will create one hundred sixty uh, new units of affordable housing, and as you see, sixty six units at 30% and 80 at family size. So that leaves us with our local implementation strategy is how we're gonna build 1,315 new units with $188. Million, did I say 188? No, no problem. <laughs> I forgot that little M in there. <laughs> yeah, it's getting late here. No, um, so we, we are setting a goal for ourselves of 300 permanent supportive housing units through this effort, which will need to, we will have to figure out a way to bring in services and operating support to achieve those goals. We want to exceed the uh, federal um, unit universal design standards um, through this work for accessible units. And we are open to doing some 80% AMI as long as um, with the small portion of funds, as long as it can, it, it, if it is advancing our ri incomes rising in place policy, so we're not displacing people if as we acquire or build, uh, acquire housing that may have existing residents that may be over income. And home ownership is, we view that as a critical strategy to advance our racial equity in housing and, and uh, help bridge that divide. So we're gonna continue looking at our project selection criteria, uh, uh, continue with our goals of advancing racial equity, and, and obviously they have to contribute to the framework goals and, uh, um, and align with other Port, um, Portland's goals for affordable housing, such as the North Northeast Preference Policy. We also wanna, uh, we'll look at uh, those projects in terms of their connection to services we know that that is a critical uh, piece of our puzzle to stabilize low-income house, houses over time. We will look at leverage and also read, readiness to proceed. The timeline for the implementation for Metro is, um, is gonna be across three different phases. We're, uh, as I mentioned before, phase one was a Metro identified a project that is already underway uh, and that will be up in Decom area, Decom neighborhood, Decom, um, is that the Coley neighborhood? No. no. That's north. Yeah. north. No, it's the Coley Jackson. Further west, yeah, no, <laughs> just north. Anyway, and phase two um, is really looking, we're, we're looking to potentially carve out a small portion of the Metro fund, which would be no more than 10%. Uh, that would potentially go towards projects that are currently under pre-development right now that have secured other public, uh, publicly competitive resources but need to secure other resources in order to move forward. So there's a, a, a small portion of funds that have existing gaps and they aren't able to move forward and we, we are looking to potentially deploy some Metro money to get those uh, funded as quickly as possible. And then the third phase would be sort of our usual process by which we would do solicitations for new projects that have yet to be identified. So right now we, are, uh, um, we have our draft on our website and we are uh, seeking input and feedback on that draft. And we've been coming around to various different committees and getting input on these concepts. We hope to finalize the local implementation strategy in December, and then we would go to City Council and the Metro Council in January. Oh, perfect timing. And I'm uh, happy to answer your questions. Talk to me a little bit about your racial equity goals. What are they, if you happen to know? 
Well, we want to look, we want to incorporate racial equity across all measures, the aspects of the development process all the way through how are, who are, who's being housed over time. So we're looking at um, outreach, project selection, um, to, well, project selection being um, are people, are developers partnering with culturally specific agencies, for example? Are they looking at um, design elements that are responsive to certain communities of color or whomever they have really identified as part of their marketing strategy? Um, they, uh, we looked, um, uh, we look very carefully more than ever at screening criteria. So it's becoming a larger part of our uh, selection process and uh, more than just fill out the regular paperwork for um, a familiar furthering fair housing marketing plans, but really diving deeper into um, are you using all the various strategies um, that, have, have, that ha can actually result in a higher percentage of people of color being housed. Mm -hmm. So doing a better, better way of tracking that initial uh, outreach plan, the actual screening, and, um, and then, and then be doing a better job of tracking over time who is actually getting into that housing. So that hasn't always been as, um, uh, as uh, the whole process hasn't been analyzed yeah. in a systematic way in the past. So we're looking more into that. Um, and then there's been, um, really, really been exciting a lot of number of partnerships that we've been seeing that are forging now um, to help advance racial equity um, through uh, resident services and um, culturally specific clinical services, uh, so particularly um, those that are coming in with permit supportive housing goals. Um, and we're also seeing, um, <laughs> I've actually was, just made a mental note myself of how many of the pro developers tonight are achieving well over the 20% initial goal that the city had for a MWSB contracting. And so through um, Portland Housing Bond, and we're gonna um, have the same goal for the Metro Bond, is a 30% DMWESB hard um, contracting goal. And the first time ever, the city doesn't have this, but we, have a, we are establishing uh, a 20% professional services goal, as well as other workforce uh, and training uh, goals as well with apprenticeship hours. So those are, we're trying to push the envelope more than the other parts of the city. Um, and what I um, have heard over and over again is that that's gonna really, that's gonna be challenging. But I got to hear tonight that sometimes you have to push the envelope for it to really make a difference. Um, and hearing that we could be maybe up to 38% um, DMWSB in our heart um, contracting goals with some of our projects, but I'm hearing tonight uh, most of the projects are well over 20%, so we're getting closer to that 30% goal, and that is really encouraging. Something you just, sometimes you just have to set the goal to make it happen. Thank you, I appreciate that. Very important to me, very important I think to this, this committee, that uh, the people who again, have been most impacted or getting a chance to benefit from the financial investment that's happening in the city at this time. So I'm excited to hear about that. Uh, you mentioned it. Uh, I do have concern around this 30% AMI, how it's going to be attained and then how it can be sustained, right? So how do we get there? And then once we get there, how do we stay there, especially when there's no voucher system or something in place? I don't know if you've you mentioned it a little bit. Can you speak a little more to it for me, please. Yes. Um, so is what we learned through the modeling of the Portland Housing Bond is that um, we, if you if you don't have a level of subsidy, so the, if you have thirty percent AMI rents, you. Uh, Generally, the don't, those rent amounts don't cover your full amount of expenses for that unit and, and, and say a debt service payment. And so you need some kind of level of subsidy, whether it's at a whole project level or it's for those specific units, either way. Um, you need some level of those 30%, some portion of them to get to either at least your 60% rent level or, or, or above. Um, and so um, if you, if the modeling, the initial modeling we've done with the Metro Bond is with this 40% goal, 40% of our 1315 having to be unsubsidized 30s, 
those projects don't um, cash flow after about 20 years. So there's a question for us as a community of how many, how, what are we expecting our, our development partners to um, keep those units affordable for that, at that level for, how, for what time period? And Metro has, um, is expecting our uh, restrictions, our co restrictive covenants to be at least 60 years. Well, we're gonna apply our 99 year affordability levels for Portland um, that we have established already. Um, and so it just puts that much more pressure um, for all of us to figure out a long-term sustainability plan for the Metro bond. Our hope is, um, is to figure out a pathway and, and secure some kind of funding stream to make this all work. It's just we can't, we have, we have, there's no um, f commitment that I can speak of right now about that. So just listening, we're talking about a 79-year gap, right? <laughs> it's kind of a, it's kind of big, it's kind of significant. Um, I'll make a statement, then I'll ask a question. The statement is, I would hate for us to further traumatize people who are already traumatized. Uh, with the housing crisis, our effort and our goal is to create stable housing, balanced housing. We all know that housing is the center of community. Everything flows around it. Um, so that's my statement. My question is, as the Oversight Committee, how do, what can we do as it relates to thinking about how, what kind of advocacy can we bring to help leverage, to help strategize, to help move agenda uh, uh, for decision makers and policy setters and, and funders to uh, support this issue? Because that's, that's a big issue. It's a big deal. And maybe you don't have an answer for it, but uh, I'm open. I think, I think uh, Director Callahan, I'm sure, would have um, uh, her set of recommendations of how that to invest, best advance that message. Uh, it is something that um, of all the outreach we had done, um, you know, people were uh, most most questions we got were how are we going to solve that 30% issue and and we said well we're open to different ideas and and so it um, it is a, it is an issue for the whole community it is a collective problem we have to face. Um, there's work with Metro that we, we want to do this in a collaborative way with Metro. Um, and so there's, a, um, you know, we've been having conversations about different, different possibilities. But um, um, I think it's just as long as um, this is something that all, all the Dur Multnomah County, City of Portland, and Metro Council are all aware that this is something that um, we are in this together in trying to overcome this issue. It's not just Portland that's facing this, it's also Gresham, the city of Gresham, mm -hmm. as well as the um, balance of county. So we're all in the same boat. The other counties have, uh, have commitments of project-based vouchers from their local housing authorities. So this is really a, a specific to Multnomah County. It's my only questions, comments from, yeah. Uh, my first question is, will Metro Bond, Metro Bond funded projects in North Northeast Portland be required to use the preference policy? Yes. So if, if there's a project that is funded with Metro Bond money in the North Northeast URA, it will, we will expect them to use the North Northeast preference policy as well. And then my next question is a lot of the um, creating opportunities for those in need on your slide. Um, people living with disabilities, seniors, veterans, and these goals plus the 30% goal really scream uh, permanent supportive housing to me. And I was wondering if there was a similar partnership with the Joint Office of Homeless Services as there was with the Portland, with the Portland bond. Uh, they are uh, fully uh, partnering with us on this effort and they are in this, in this um, uh, place with us of trying to secure the long-term services funding as well as the rental uh, assistance to, to, to meet our uh, local 300 PSH goal for this effort. That's, uh, I, think, I think you cover sure. a lot of my questions. Yep. Uh, I'm still uh, stuck back in an earlier presentation where we talked about shipping over an, uh, hundreds of people that are interested in these housing uh, units and yet maybe only 
a small, maybe 10 or 15 percent actually apply. And the answer I got back, if I heard it correctly, was that it's up to the applicants to, um, you know, apply for those units. And I'm wondering why they are not applying. Do we track that? Do we care? And maybe we should be maybe getting some input because if we're building units and they're not interested, then we're on the wrong track. We're just building units. And I don't see that as being a big benefit, but um, I'm just curious why there's not more interest. And I think you're speaking to the Magnolia 2 presentation. Yes. And they talked about the numbers uh, and I don't know, I think that's a great point. I don't know if that's across the board, um, which is kind of the question I was leading into when I asked Matthew Schaubold if are we seeing repeat? Because if they're not getting in one uh, facility, are they trying to get into another facility, et cetera, et cetera. It's one of the, the questions I have in my mind is, is how effective are we at making sure the barriers are being reduced and that people are being encouraged? And are we at a moment where community is kind of feeling some burnout as well, uh, especially uh, in light of the, the early um, barriers and, and hurdles that were associated with the preference policy, some of the missteps, and then how it got reported in community? I think there's some work on our part um, to straighten up um, uh, the marketing the communication around it. I don't know, but that's that's a great point to be aware of. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yep. No, I think it's a little bit early for us to no, totally know how many folks will, um, from the those who initially express interest, will apply and, and get into the MEG, MEG 2. I think we're still in the middle of trying to understand that, that um, issue, and I, um, and it is, it is something that is a, a challenge, I think, for a lot of housing providers, is you, you put out what we call like a pre-app, and you wanna get just as many people as you can with minimum amount of data that you have to put in, but then the next phase, there's a lot more paperwork you have to fill out. So there's, um, you, you, we, we do lose people in that process, which is a little bit of a shame to figure that out. My other comment or suggestion, and this is not just for PHB, but I, I wish that the mayor's office representative was here, 100% um, um, supportive of uh, culturally specific organization partnerships and MWESB. I think we have to be aware that um, the culturally specific partnership uh, points or um, preference is not specific to Portland, it's statewide. So the 9% application, the Lyft application, all of the Metro Bond applications are looking for culturally specific partnerships and those culturally specific organizations are going to need help staffing up. They're gonna need help expanding their capacity in order to answer the need. I refuse to believe that these partnerships are um, impossible to obtain because these organizations are so small, that to me is just an excuse, but we have to recognize that if we wanna make that a priority on the development side, we have to make it a priority on helping organizations skill up. The other thing I wanted to mention is MWESB participation is really important, but again, we need to get more businesses registered. We need to have a way to make that process um, smoother mainly because every letter in that acronym is important and one of them is small. So you can't have one structural engineer firm that's an MWESB certified firm that's gonna serve the whole state, that's not small. We need more than one. So that those two things are, are require money and funds and time and staff and that's not necessarily entirely the, that burden. I don't put it entirely on PHB or Home Forward, but we are not going to achieve these goals if we don't help organizations get to the place where they can be. Otherwise, the culturally specific organization partnerships mean nothing. It's just a piece of paper that I asked, a for, you know, I, please sign this and say you're my partner so I can get points, and that is the opposite of racial equity. That is tokenism and, and the worst way possible. So I just wanted to bring that forward. I think this committee is really supportive of those goals. I think in general, the city of Portland is supportive of those goals, but 
um, we have to we have to put some of our money where I'm where where our mouth is and support these organizations in their growth and in their capacity. And just to clarify, note the word capacity gets thrown out a lot, and sometimes it's taken to mean um, expertise. But in this case, I actually mean having enough staff to do the work because I believe in the expertise of these organizations. And that's all. Thank you. I appreciate it. Great commentary. Thank you, uh, Molly, for your presentation. Um, Jillian, you open up a, um, an area of discussion and concern that I've been having and finding myself in these rooms on a regular basis. One of, the, one of those things is about lowering, lowering the barriers or even figuring out how we make it easy for culturally specific organizations to become certified. There are so many hoops that you have to hop through and so many issues that are associated that create barriers. And so when we say these words like we can't find them, what they're saying is we can't find certified ones. And you can't find certified ones because of the issues that keep them from being certified. So we've got a lot of work to do on a variety of uh, levels. And like I said, it's, it's every line. So if you are a, non, a culturally specific organization and you are a nonprofit, you don't meet the B. You're not a business. You cannot be an MWESB certified firm if you're a nonprofit. You can't be that if you're big. So if that's the metric that we're using, and I don't object to it, um, we have to address we have to address each of those letters and make sure that they have the support that they need to become a certified firm, um, help other organizations become certified firms, and you know transfer some of this workforce training that we've been focusing on into entrepreneurship. Agreed. I didn't mention it earlier. I want to say it now. Thanks very much for being the representative of the Oversight Committee on the Williams Russell Project. It is your duty to bring back to the committee what is happening. So thank you for being faithful. I think it's what, 24 meetings? Yes. That, uh, oh, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that we're into. All right, at this point, we've gotten to our public comment and I did not see any public comment cards. Okay, wonderful. Who wants to stay till 9.30? Okay. The hands kept getting smaller and smaller. Smaller, less and less. We have one uh, tonight, and that is Linda. Tell us, Kennedy, if, if you would come and join us. You will have three minutes. I might not need that this Thank time. Thank you. Hi, I'm Linda, and tonight I'm not representing who I work for, but I'm representing the community that I grew up in, as well as the descendants of Vanport, um, my, my parents being specific, and my senior siblings. Um, um, I just was listening to about the, the bond, and I want to make sure, or asking if you can make sure that the seniors are considered uh, with this, these funds. Not just the seniors, but the African-American seniors because that population is growing and growing. Like I said, my siblings, I have a 60, no, 72-year-old sister who um, lives in an apartment and she's on the second floor. She's had a stroke. She can't find anything cheaper she's it's fixed income so it's, and she's that's my sister and i know there's many that are like that and she's out in southeast portland where she did not grow up um but that's where she can afford to live um and that's just one like i said of many that are in that situation right now and that population like i said is growing she used to be a teacher um, she served in this community. She graduated from college in this at PSU. I mean, so it's like lots of things that connects her to Vanport, because you know PSU right. was birthed out of Vanport as well. So it's just a lot of those those people right now are that population's growing, and we keep saying seniors um, in a lot of these um, presentations, but. Everything we're building, we're building up. It got a lot of stairs. They have special needs. They don't need a lot of stairs. They need lower cabinets, lower countertops. Um, 
showers versus a bathtub. It's just a lot of amenities that our senior population needs, and it'll be good if we can consider them and think about that when we are issuing out these funds um, or making them available for opportunities for these people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate your, your commentary. Uh, for the sake of record and for the community, you may or may not know that I sit on the Metro bond. So I am uh, on the Metro bond and several of the items that were mentioned tonight are things that I'm absolutely advocating for. Um, uh, we have to, it, it's so interesting uh, in our current community of bikers and um, high rise buildings, um, we are making a statement as to what our values are about the people we want to live in the city. And it does not say that it's a value for those who are aging. And the thing that, that is mind boggling to me is while the people who are making the decisions and are in the, the seats of uh, putting these wonderful things in place, uh, in my mind I'm thinking, do you not realize you're getting older also? that at some point the very things you've created you won't be able to benefit from? Are you not paying attention to that? Um, unfortunately, and this is what you need to know, that's a minority voice, unfortunately. And so my appeal to you as community members is to make your voice known. You can communicate to Metro, you can communicate to decision makers, you can communicate to city council that this is a value that this is important to us. I will continue to be the voice that I am. I will continue to do what I do, but I'm one. It would be great if we had several others. Um, we have a responsibility to the generation in front of us. We are where we are because of what they suffered and invested and built. It's irresponsible for us to not take care of those who've helped us get here. So, <clears throat> that being said, we've got an announcement from uh, Ms. Goodlow, and then we're going to wrap up our meeting for tonight. So, um, last but certainly not least, a um, couple uh, pieces of information. Our January meeting is going to be on the 16th, not on the 9th. It will be on a, um, the third Thursday, not the second Thursday in January. And then in March... Um, Oh, uh, we will be having a Williams and Russell uh, community meeting on the 9th of January, and it'll be in the big, in the big room. Um, and so, please come and um, participate in the um, in that process. And more information will be coming out about that within the next couple weeks. But my big announcement is that um, in March. Um, we will be celebrating five years of the North Northeast Housing Strategy. Uh, January of uh, 2015, City Council approved the strategy, and in March, we will be having a celebration here um, over in the big community room. Um, and uh, at that point, we will have over 500 rental units, either uh, leased or soon to be leased. Um, we have nearly 400 homeowners that have received home repair services. We've purchased three pieces of property, and we have homeowners that are people that are, have become homeowners, not as many as we had hoped, but people in process that had never believed that they would be homeowners. So we have a lot of things to celebrate in March, so be looking for more information about that. I'm just very excited because when we started this, and I'm sorry I'm getting a little choked up, I never imagined that we would be able to do what we have done. And I know it hasn't been easy. And I'm, um, I know that our development partners have um, struggled along with us and not always been happy with us. But I appreciate them coming along with us because this is, um, as Dr. Holt has said, this is generational change that we are doing here in Northeast Portland. So thank you all, and we'll be looking for and we'll get more information out. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Make sure you get a little more food.